I would like to thank you, Simone Bellini, for encouraging me to present my research in the first place. I would like to thank you, Jean-Louis Bautreau, for proposing me to present this colloquium and for organizing and actually advertising this colloquium and uh, making sure that everything works smoothly throughout. Then I would like to thank you, the Women's Research Group of the department, for their precious feedback on this work. And then I would like to thank Dan Nicolai and the assistance of the Language Lab for putting together the clips for me. Um, Marco Tullio Giordanas, quando sei nato, non puoi più nasconderti, and the brothers Dardenne, La Promesse, are an Italian and a Belgian coming of age tale dealing with questions of friendship, integration, and illegal immigration to Europe. These films are a representative of a process of transformation that Europe has been undergoing as a result of a flood of immigration from within and outside its borders. In the minds of people, politicians and intellectuals, images um, of a multicultural post Europe have replaced those of a fortress Europe anchored to nationalisms and colonialism. Um, Italy's recent nomination of Italo Congolese Cecil Kiange as a Minister of Integration reflects this new image of Europe made of crossroads in which integration remains an inadequate term if we are to envision the collective expression of new Europe. Through its proliferation of genres, recent cinema about the subject of immigration uh, documents the tensions between, on the one hand, an image of increasing fluidity and mobility with the emergence of social, new socioeconomic realities and alliances, and on the other, uh, the necessity to contain migratory flows with new regulations. Privileged th themes of this uh, cinema of immigration or diasporic cinema are, just to name a few within Italian cinema and Francophone cinema, uh, Le Grand Voyage by Ismail Ferrucchi or uh, Le Théo Arène d'Archimède by Mehdi Sharaf. Um, also, journeys of hope and uh, return, such as Exil and Gajodilo by Tony Gatlin, mm -hmm. or transcultural friendships between a newly arrived immigrant and a European, often of lower class, such as in La Promesse, which we're going to see today, <coughs> or uh, the Italians Io L'Altro uh, by Mosel Melliti and Cover Boy by Carmine Amoroso. Uh, Giordana's and the Dardenne's films fit uh, both this last model of cultural friendships and also complicated by representing issues of youth economic precariousness, especially La Promesse de Promise by the Dardenne. Um, an intimacy of themes between the two movies prompt comparison and a discussion in a transnational context. Europe and the making of new alliances. Uh, two, the contrast between the boys and their father's principles based on a hegemonic model. Uh, and three, uh, the newly found connection between boys coming of age and female immigrants who are exposed to the risks of even greater uh, exploitation. In Giordana's film, Sandro, interpreted by Matteo Gadola, is the teenage song of a rich industrial man from the north, um, where civic consciousness is awakened when he falls into the Mediterranean Sea and is rescued by a boat of illegal immigrants heading towards southern Italy. Sandro is radically transformed by his friendship with uh, young Romanian Alina, interpreted by Esther Azan, and the discovery of the brutality, brutal reality of underage prostitution and the pornography to which she is subjected. Um, in La Promesse, Igor, interpreted by Jeremy Renier, who has no mother, steals and falsifies documents for his father, um, Roger, interpreted by Olivier Gourmet, who traffics illegal immigrants. Igor is forced to take responsibility of Asita, interpreted by Asita Guadrugo, 
an African woman when her husband, Amidou, by, uh, dies by Roger's fault. Uh, the director's choice to narrate the friendship of female immigrants and European boys raises a number of questions. Uh, first of all, what kind of new community do they form and describe? How are the young male Europeans transformed by their encounter and by the necessity to connect with the immigrant female other? I will first look at La Promesse by Belgian filmmakers, the Dardan. Now, the Dardan have always been concerned with uh, the representation of the marginal and ethics of community. Imagining different modalities of contact is also an integral part of their visual style. Their so-called um, body camera, as numerous scholars have pointed out, fosters affective contact between spectator and image by enhancing the sensorial experience of the spectator through touch, smell, and hearing. In my talk today, I want to explore how the directors use this affective cinematography in order to suggest uh, new communities. Uh, my reflection is inspired, among others, by French philosopher Jacques Derrida, um, and his notion of community and friendship. In Politique, uh, Politique de l'amitié, Politics of Friendship, um, Derrida explained that friendship is first and foremost a process of becoming attuned with someone else, which in French, uh, it, transla uh, it translates with ouvrir notre oreille et s'accorder avec quelqu'un. Derrida uses the double meaning of the word accord uh, which we may translate with agreement or accord, connoting its oral dimension in a social way. Accord is also entente, which in French, and in, a, in its equivalent, Italian equivalent, intesa, means pact, bond, complicity, with the root of the verb entendre, meaning both hearing and comprehending, understanding. The multiple connotation of Derrida's accord apply, in my view, to the reading of the bonds made by the boys with the female immigrants. Because in order to come of age, Sandro and Igor must attune with the female experience of exploitation to which they are initially desensitized and thus gain a different comprehension of what it means to belong and to being a responsible citizen. According to a famous Italian saying, ogni promessa e debito, uh, all promises debt, uh, promise, the title of the Dardenne's movie, is a principle of alliance based on debt. Italian philosopher Roberto Esposito explained that debt, or munus, is one of the founding conditions of communities which is constituted in turn by, and I'm quoting, the totality of person united not by a property, but precisely by an obligation or a debt." Unquote. Esposito also explained that the munus, or the obligation upon which lie a communitas, is a contract that erases the idea of property to establish a relationship based upon lack, or more precisely, upon the lack of the proper. In the promesse, Igor uh, faces two kinds of obligation, and this makes him part of two totally different ways of building community. The first obligation is towards his father, and the second towards the immigrant, Amidou. The bond with his father is characterized by dependence and uncritical imitation, and within this bond, Igor lacks a sense of his own self. If it's, true that, if it's true that Igor's affiliation with Roger is biological, because Roger is actually the biological father, it is also an improper complicity, as the attribute communis, in its meaning of impure, suggests. Igor performs a series of impure or dirty jobs for his father, such as falsifying documents for the traffic of illegal immigrants. Through his dirty services to his father, Igor unconsciously perpetrates an exploitative and hegemonic model of community. At the same time, he also submits to this model as someone who is himself exploited. In this sense, Igor's promise to his father is an obligation 
that limits his individual freedom and also hinders his development of a civic and a moral responsibility towards others. This is why, um, in the beginning of the film, Igor appears desensitized towards his father's dishonesty and does not have a problem with tricking an elderly lady at the gas station in order to steal money. However, we must understand Igor's lack of empathy in the social and economic context that produced him. Raised in the outskirts of the Belgian city of Liège, Igor is a member of a post-industrial working class, a class that lives, and I'm quoting, in a precarious position, displaced by the aspects of an increasingly globalized economy, unquote. This setting is marked by loss and by conflict. Belgium's loss of the Congo in 1960, and with it, its colonial power, the austerity politics adopted by the current government, along with massive working class strikes, and the progressive impoverishment of the working class in the Flanders, the region of Liège. Igor thus experiences a sense of uh, precariousness that depends both on a loss of identity of the working class and the rapacity of employers like his own father, who take advantage of youth and immigrant precariousness. In the private sphere, Roger, similar to the patriarchal figure described by black feminist Bell Hooks, erases the humanity of the boy by negating his right to leisure, to have fun, and also to emotional expression. By playing the body, Roger can more easily con control his son's emotional life. And this particular affiliation, that of the body, is reinforced by a series of symbolic gestures, such as the tattoo that Roger paints on Igor's shoulder, or the ring he gives him, and that, uh, Roger, um, that Igor is going to sell at the end in order to help Asita, the immigrant. Um, Roger even arranges for Igor's one night stand with an older woman so that he may lose his virginity. This scene takes place in a karaoke bar. The father and the son sing together, um, captured in a moment of seemingly tender complicity, is evidenced by a series of medium shots framing the two together. However, Despite this um, image or apparent complicity, Roger never ceases to be in a dominating position, making us hear his prevailing voice, especially when father and son sing along with Roger's female guest in a distorted crescendo of voices. The background song, um, Marina Marina, about female seduction is an interesting social commentary. Originally performed by an Italian, son of southern miners immigrated to Bel Belgium in the post-war period. It's an, this song is a nostalgic refrain. It evokes a period and an identity long gone, Roger and Igor's working class, but suddenly reinscribed into the condition of the immigrant, a condition which, paradoxically, Roger and Igor share. Both the immigrant exiled, and the déclassé, the French word for a person devoted from his social status, um, share a sense of precariousness in the loss of identity and belonging that is produced by globalized economy. Yet, at this point, Ego does not understand that his condition of déclassé makes him closer to the immigrant because he still holds on to the promise made to Roger thus subordinating himself to him, making him himself into his father's property. In his discussion of Munus, Esposito states that the removal of property is what alters the subject, a quote, forcing him to take leave of himself and to alter himself, unquote. To a certain extent, Ego begins coming of age when he becomes other, that is, when he withdraws from his father's ownership. This moment coincides with the moment in which he starts attuning with voices out, um, outside of his father's. For instance, the voice of Amidou, a worker who comes from Burkina Faso with his wife and child. One day, in order to escape, the police who come to check on undocumented workers, Amidou 
falls from a scaffolding and seriously injures himself. To avoid uh, reporting uh, the accident to the authorities, Roger refuses to take Amidou to the hospital and lets him die as he astonishes Igor looks on. And actually what we see here is Igor uh, trying to help Amidou, who's bleeding a lot and, and, and he's wrapping a belt around um, his leg, but Amidou is like that. And then Roger comes in and says, what are you doing? Just stop it. We just leave him there. Right before um, dying, Amidou um, asked Igor to take care of Asita and their son. Following this promise, Igor's relationship with Roger and Asita radically changes. A change with the Dardenne represents by emphasizing Asita's emerging voice in Igor's life and in his consciousness. Igor establishes at first a timid contact with Asita. With the pretext of returning the radio, that Amidou was listening to when he fell from the scaffolding, he goes into the room of Asita, entering a space forbidden to him by his father. While some critics claim that the father's prohibition has something to do with the fear of women interfering into men's affairs, I read the boy's instruction somewhat differently. He goes transpassing his father's border in possession, speaks to a desire for pushing moral and cultural borders by reinforcing the debt or obligation that now he has towards Amidou. Moreover, the radio, which broadcast only African music, is the only object also that binds a cita to Amidou and both to Africa, with an affective and a transcultural value which, and I'm quoting, attune our minds to hidden histories, according to uh, Joseph May. When Igor uh, returns the radio to Asita, he starts, so to speak, attuning his mind to her inner history of pain and loss, thus becoming a participant in a world, in a world of immigrant, as a witness and a listener. This shift becomes evident in a few sequences that represent Igor's newly found sense of responsibility towards Asita. For example, when he founds out that uh, Roger wants to sell the woman into prostitution, he escapes uh, with her from Roger's house. And after escaping, he accompanies the woman to the police, um, to the police station, to announce that mm, Amidou has disappeared. And later, he is also by her side when she attends a spiritual ritual with an African priest to find out what happened to her husband. In the second half of the movie, Igor's change um, is impacted by Asita's emerging voice as she expresses her determination to know what happened to Amidou and her refusal to leave without knowing the truth. Asita actually does not know that her husband is dead because Roger has lied to her. Um, in this refusal, there is a clear denunciation and rejection of Roger's manipulation, which underscores Igor's fragility on the one hand, and Asita's strength and resolution, as we can see in this sequence. Ah, Fanny, c'est son père. Tu vas pas rester ici. Tu vas partir. Le poulet du corps malade, qu'est-ce qui reste ici Mais t'es con ou quoi Tu me fais chier avec ton poulet du corps malade. T'inquiète, je vais dormir. Tu seras quand même chez les putes. Et moi, je vais me faire frapper la gueule par mon père. J'aurais jamais lutté des jamais. Ça Qu'est-ce qu'il y a Hein Lâche Lâche-moi that we just saw between Asita and Igor is an embrace that binds the two together and will finally give Igor the strength to confront his father and separate from him um, in actually one of the most powerful scenes of the movie, uh, which is the one that I'm showing right now.
Mais la vérité. Avec mon Olivier. Reste ici. de savoir. Elle part plus, on n'en parle plus, c'est fini. screams uh, Igor, which means shut up. And by silencing, uh, finally, his father, uh, Igor is assuming uh, the voice and the tone of refusal of Asita. Um, yet it is only in the final sequence, shot at the train station, when Asita is about to leave, that she and Igor truly accord each other when Igor finally reveals that Amdu is dead. Igor, as confession as a couple of effects, it does leave them both fatherless, so to speak, but grants them a freedom from an exploited father. It also reconnects them, as we can see visually, in a space where a future alliance cannot be envisioned without the possibility of mutual trust and the recognition of their common precarious uh, condition. Whereas La Promesse ends on the silent agreement of Asita and Igor walking side by side in an unknown direction, Giordana's film opens on the loud lament of an African immigrant in the square of Brescia, a mid-sized industrial city of the north. Uh, the man attempts in vain to have a phone conversation from a phone booth which is out of order, and Sandro, the young protagonist, tries in vain to point out that the phone does not work, a tragic commentary on the incommunicability between the immigrants and Italians. In return, Sandro hears an incomprehensible phrase that he will later transcribe and try to decipher. Sandro is, in that moment, right before seeing the immigrant and hearing him, admiring his favorite motorbike on the shop window, a motorbike symbolizing a maturity not yet reached, um, and the image of consumerist Italy. The immigrant, whose verbal language um, is incomprehensible to Sandro, has an eloquent body language as he strips off his clothes in a desperate struggle. This opening sequence already offers us a frame of interpretation for the movie. Sandro will need to learn how to communicate with the immigrants, first by immersing himself 
in the world of the immigrants. And through this immersion, it will then attune with the affective language that multicultural Italy requires of him. The occasion to learn is given during the boat trip um, he's taken with uh, his father and a friend off the coast of Greece. And during this trip, he accidentally falls into the Mediterranean Sea. A long and deliberately slow sequence makes us empathize with Sandro's precarious condition. His floating body is framed in low angle in the middle of a vast sea, with a backlight enhancing the danger of his situation. As soon as he begins his drowning descent, he's rescued by an immigrant boat heading towards southern Italian shores. From this point on, Sandro's personal resurfacing is inextricably linked with the collective story of the immigrant survival, thus representing the process of Italy's coming of age to a new multicultural dimension. The fact of illegal immigrants reaching the coast of Italy is not news. It is a daily and often unspoken tragedy that has recently come to media attention again when the Pope visited the immigrant centers of the island of Lampedusa and with the recent rescue of a boat full of diseased um, immigrants. European politicians and societies are alerted to the phenomenon not merely for the endless floods of people escaping poverty and wars, but also the infraction of basic human rights which legal immigration often involves. Although in Europe illegal immigration is about so-called overstayers, uh, a smaller percentage is made up of undocumented immigrants who come from the Mediterranean with no visas and even pay in order to be taken to the southern coasts. Um, let's note that the movie uh, came out around the time in which the Italian law Bossi Fini was enforced to ensure stricter measures to regulate Im immigration. In Giordana's movie, uh, the boat is driven by two lower class southern navigators uh, who are paid under the table to bring immigrants from the Middle East, Africa and Romania to Italy. In order to avoid being taken as hostage, Sandro pretends he is not Italian and starts repeating the mysterious phrase that is transcribed after the African man's lament. The meaning of this phrase is, as we will later learn, once you're born, you can no longer hide. Quando sei nato non puoi più nasconderti, which is the title of the movie, and a commentary on the impossibility of concealing oneself or being a clandestine. However, in this context, the phrase allows Sandro to play the clandestine and, so to speak, remaining hidden in order to survive, something that the immigrants cannot play for a long time due to the screening system to which they are immediately subjected once they are in Italy. When the young Romanian Radu understands what Sandro is doing, he comes to his rescue, distracting the navigators and making friends with him. Meglio non fidarsi di nessuno, nemmeno di me. Better not to trust anybody, not even me, says Radu to Sandro, revealing from the onset that bonds in general and his friendship with Sandro are built on mistrust. This lack of reciprocity will describe not only their friendship, but also more broadly the relationship between the immigrants and the Italian family, as well as the bond between Radu and his presumed sister, Alina. At Radu's suggestion, the two Romanian teenagers, Alina and Radu, pass as brother and sister when in fact they are a couple. However, Alina's romantic attachment to Radu is already suggested in the beginning by the sentimental refrain of an Italian pop song about love, un emozione per sempre, a never ending emotion, which the girl keeps singing during her, uh, mm, while she's in, uh, in the boat. Um, this attachment uh, that she shows allows instead the boy to manipulate her and expose her to the abuse of other people for the purpose of survival. For example, this is evidenced in a sequence in the beginning where Radu allows Alina to be touched sexually um, by one of the navigators in exchange for water. It is only when the immigrants reach Italy and enter the hospitality center that we understand that Alina is already part of that community of women who crowd the center of Father Chalso, 
who rescued them from prostitution. The sense of community among these women is only suggested by a choir of indistinct voices and the use of a camera traveling over the bodies of the women taking communal showers. This communitarian image is the only portrayal of the hidden clandestine realm of female immigrants, but Sandro's desire to know serves the director well in his civic endeavor to bring to light the clandestine world of the immigrants. Once in the shelter, Sandro first asked the police that he be put up in the center with the other immigrants. He later expressed to his parents the desire to adopt Radu and Alina and make them part of his family. In response, his parents asked the social worker to adopt only Alina. As they consider her more vulnerable, a request frustrated both by the bureaucracy and by the girl's refusal to leave without Radu. Yet, their request also underscores a form of selfishness that speaks of a broader politics of inclusion and exclusion. In order to reward Radu for saving Sandro's life and to part him from Alina, Bruno offers the boy money and his cell phone. But Radu, you, uh, sorry, Radu uses this means to run away from the shelter and once is in the house of Sandro's family, he escapes again, bringing with him Alina and some things he stole from the house. Um, his act reconfirms the, uh, the idea that no one should be trusted, as he betrays both the Italian family and hinders legal action for Alina's adoption. The juxtaposition of the adoption and the robbery episodes may represent the director's critique of the dichotomy between the whole society uh, who screens immigrants and the representation of certain immigrants is bad. It is not surprising that Radu plays the role of the bad guy, the one with whom no alliance is even possible but through defection. The robbery exacerbates Bruno, the father, uh, Bruno's prejudices against the immigrants, which reflects in turn political speeches uh, that present immigrants as internal enemies who undermine social and national well-being. These discourses fueled and distorted by the media re-emerge in the racist comments of two older women who recognize Sandro on the bus and commiserate him for ending up with a bunch of Negroes in a clear Russian dialect, which sounds kind of ironic too, even if you would die. At that point, we start seeing that Sandro is less attuned with these voices than with the voice of his friend Alina. Just like Igor in La Comesse discriminates between Asita's affective tone and Roger's controlling voice. After Radius and Alina's disappearance, everything seems to return to normal for Sandro. But suddenly, he receives a phone call from Alina and that starts looking for her, moved by what he thinks it is a clear request of love and affection. The other's voice, in this case a female other, contains, as Derrida explains, an affective tonality, and Sandro shows sensitivity to such tonality as he initially does to the emotional language of the African man at the beginning of the movie. In search for Alina, Sandro gets to Milan and crosses the wall that separates the city from the immigrant camp, a wall ironically covered with manifestos of Forza Italia, former Prime Minister Berlusconi's political party, so manifestos campaigning in favor of the containment of immigrants. After Sandro literally crosses over the line from the city to the camp, the affective tonality of the other's voice becomes prominent. Um, the rediscovery of that affective tonality is constructed one of the most powerful scenes of the movie. The background song that you're going to hear is the refrain that Alina sang while in the boat, which now sounds as a distorted commentary of her romantic attachment to Radu. And the song is called Un'emozione per sempre, a never ending emotion.
The films I presented today, although different in their setting and cinematic style, share the common narrative of a teenage boy's journey towards understanding and civic re-education in the new multicultural dimension of global Europe. In a social-political context in which education is seen as the critical terrain for immigrant integration into the nation, the movies draw attention instead to a process of re-education of the European boy through interaction. Can interaction, a term dear to Italian integration minister Kienge, help us envision the new face of global Europe? I would like to end my reflection today with a passage from Derrida. In it, the act of tendre le rail, which we translate with opening up one's ear, is given as a condition of proximity that goes beyond our bodily barriers. Tendre l'oreille, ce n'est pas écouter des sensations auditives et des bruits. Non, nous tendons l'oreille vers ce qui est au-delà de l'oreille, de l'oreille ouverte, là-bas, dans le monde, auprès de ce qui est par exemple utilisable dans le monde, ou auprès de ce qui est entendu, de cet auprès dont le voisinage n'est ni le tout proche, ni l'infiniment distant. The Derridian image of the auprès which I translate with close by, actually helps me describe the final image of both movies in which the boys and the female immigrants stand side by side, somewhat friends, somewhat strangers, in a space of regained trust. We may then read the bond between them in terms of a new global agreement that is a different social contract because it implies something affective and more, and more importantly, a contact that was previously missing or hindered. This contact lies on the disposition to transpassing symbolic barriers, cultural, familial, social, and going, so to speak, beyond years in order to reconnect with the dimension of the female immigrant empathically or affectively. Thank you.